Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. It was a hot July day in 1916, and 11-year-old Lester Stilwell, along with a group of other boys, decided to go down to the Matawan Creek to swim, splash around, and cool off. Some people in the small New Jersey shore town of Matawan had already heard of two recent fatal shark attacks on ocean bathers in Beach Haven and Spring Lake. However, no one worried about a shark in the Matawan Creek, as it was one and a half miles inland from the Raritan Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. However, much to the horror of his friends, young Lester was attacked by a shark in the creek. The boys immediately ran into town to get help. Help came in the form of Stanley Fisher, a 24-year-old athletic and popular local businessman who was always looking out for others. Stanley Fisher and two other men raced to the creek in an effort to save Lester. When he realized that Lester could no longer be alive, Stanley dove repeatedly into the murky water to retrieve Lester's body for his family. Just as he found Lester's body and was bringing it to the surface, he too was brutally attacked by the shark. Tragically, Lester and Stanley became the third and fourth victims of fatal shark attacks at the Jersey Shore in less than two weeks. Not far from where Lester and Stanley were attacked, a young boy named Joseph Dunn had his leg severely bitten by the shark. However, he would survive his injuries. In this episode of Your History, Your Story, we will be speaking with Al Savalane, Matawan town historian and author of Stanley Fisher, Shark Attack Hero of a Bygone Age. Al will tell the story of Stanley Fisher and how he and other brave men faced a killer shark in a small New Jersey community in the summer of 1916. In addition to Al Savalane, we will be speaking with Justin Pratt, the founder of the Facebook page, 1916 New Jersey Shark Attacks. Justin, who lives in Tennessee, is one of many enthusiasts from around the world who have taken a keen interest in these events. Justin, like many others, can trace his enthusiasm back to the 1975 blockbuster movie, Jaws, in which the New Jersey shark attacks were mentioned. We hope you enjoy this thrilling tale from a bygone age. I'd now like to welcome Matawan town historian and author of the book, Stanley Fisher, Shark Attack Hero of a Bygone Age, Al Savalain, to our show. Welcome, Al. Hello, James. Nice to see you. So, Al, first of all, it's great to be here with you in person in Matawan, New Jersey. And let me start by asking you, when did you first develop an interest in history? Well, actually... uh It happened a long time ago. I went to Gettysburg College, historic Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And while I was there, I became very involved in Civil War history. Yes. Did you decide to go to Gettysburg because of being interested in history at that time? Or did you become interested while you were there? I loved history before that, but I really, really got into it in a serious way when I was at Gettysburg College. You almost can't help yourself out there, can you? (laughs) Every time you turn around, you find a historic item. Yes, definitely. So you now live in Matawan, New Jersey, but you were actually born elsewhere. Can you tell us about that? And how did you come to move to Matawan, New Jersey? Sure. I, uh, I was born in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, which is in western Pennsylvania. It's northwest of Pittsburgh. Oh, really? And what brought you to Matawan? Actually, th- that story was uh, after I graduated from college, uh, I was in the Army ROTC. This was during the Vietnam War. And I then went on active duty in the Army, finished my active duty commitment. I was a a reserve officer, and I eventually spent 11 years in the Army Reserve. I got married at that time. My wife was also from my hometown of Newcastle, but she actually got a job in Homedale, New Jersey. Ah. And so after I came off active duty, we got married, and we moved out here. 
kind of a funny thing in the, our lives. It just it brought us here. It wasn't exactly a totally planned event. Got it. So you came to Matawan and you brought your interest in history with you. Tell us how did you start to get interested in the 1916 shark attacks that occurred here in Matawan? Well, one thing I, I knew that Matawan was a historic area. It was founded in 1686. So a lot of history, all the way going back to the Revolutionary War, happened here. And uh, my wife and I, coming to a new town, we joined the Matawan Historical Society. And when I was in the Matawan Historic, I met people of different ages, and, and I heard about the story of Stanley Fisher and the shark attack. Before I even came to Matawan, I'd heard about the shark attack, 1916 shark attack, along the coast. I didn't know the, the specifics of the Matawan Creek incident mm -hmm. until I joined the Matawan Historical Society in the early 1970s, but I actually spoke to people through their, and they would tell the stories that their parents and grandparents <laughs> told them about uh, this brave young man who lost his life, you know, trying to recover the body of this young boy. And that just amazed me. And I started reading and uh, meeting people who also were interested in that, that particular incident. And one thing led to another. Al, did you meet back in the earlier days uh, when you were in Matawan, did you meet anybody who remembered the incident happening? Yes. I, they were not necessarily participants in the shark attack, but I met people who were, you know, in their late 80s, uh, who were spending their childhood at that time, and they, they knew people in town. And I picked up certain names uh, of interest, and uh, Stanley Fisher and... Uh, where his, his house was located, different things like that, with the church that he went to and all of these things. One thing kind of led to another. And then eventually I developed a cemetery tour with uh, the Historical Society. And uh, actually several people from the shark attack you know, incident were buried there. But the two key people who died in Matawan, Lester Stilwell and Stanley Fisher, are buried in Rose Hill Cemetery. And while I was developing my presentation, I would talk about Stanley Fisher and Lester at their graves. And the tremendous courage was displayed on July 12, 1916, when, when this happened. Yeah, excellent. So again, that personal history is involved here, and that you're able to meet people who remembered it happening. Of course, in 2022, there's nobody around now who was actually here when that happened, but to know that you had that, just that feel for the personal history, and when people went to the cemetery, you were talking about it while looking at the graves and giving people an idea of what happened. So, before we talk about the incident on uh, July 12th, 1916, the actual shark attacks, can you paint a picture for us what Matawan, New Jersey looked like and felt like on July 12th, 1916? It's interesting because Matawan really is very close to Raritan Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. It's only a mile and a half distance. But uh, Matawan in those days, they had factories. We had a, a flaked rice factory. We had a, a sawmill factory. We had a barrel factory. Different things like that. In addition to, if you went you know, a few blocks beyond the center of town, you'd find farms. You don't always find farms that close to a shore town. Right. So it, it was a thing that we knew. It was more like Matawan was close to the ocean, but not actually a seaside town like, uh, you know, uh, other towns uh, along the shore are. So it's kind of a combination of both. So it had its own kind of character. Yeah, so but weren't people walking around with flip-flops and carrying boogie boards and stuff like that? It was people were working in these factories that you speak about. Were people pretty close back then? I mean, pretty much everybody know everybody in the town. Was it that small back in 1916? Yes, technically we call Matawan a small town, but it's not much more than a village back in those days, between 1,200 to 1,500 people. And many people had been there their whole lives. It was not a commuter town back in 1916. And uh, the railroad had just come to Matawan in 1875. So, uh, you know, it, it was not quite the way we think of a commuter town today. You know, there were a lot of small shops. There were a number of lodges. There were four main churches on Main Street, <laughs> so uh -huh. you can walk down, regardless of whatever religion you are. You look this way, there's a church. You look that way, there's another church, this and that. So there was this feeling that, uh, and if, if there was an incident in town, everybody knew about it. There was a, a newspaper, the Matawan Journal, that everyone in town subscribed to. A very <laughs> detailed little town, small town newspaper. 
you had about eight pages with very small print. So you could find out who was doing what and when was it happening in this small town. Oh, that's so cool because I've read some of those old papers in different towns that I've looked up online and you find out that uh, uh, Sally Smith and her family went to visit her grandma up in Scranton, Pennsylvania for the weekend and so-and-so had a party at their house around the piano, and there's things like that. There's such cool stories. And what they had for dinner. <laughs> and what they had for dinner. Hey, you know, today you got people up posting on Facebook what they had for dinner, so I guess things haven't changed that much. <laughs> so 1916, so Woodrow Wilson was president. There was a terrible war raging on in Europe, and the United States was, had not entered it yet. But I would imagine it was sort of in people's minds to some degree what was going on over there, would you say? Very much so. Uh, there was something, uh, in addition to the war, you know, uh, people were, 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 in a sense, relieved that we weren't involved in it. The, the idea of going into a full-blown European war, uh, there were a lot of people in America who just said, that's, that's not really our business. We weren't thinking of ourselves as a, a complete world power. There was something else happening in 1916, that summer. There was a, a major polio epidemic in New York City. Mm. And back in those days, uh, you know, the summer months were, were really, really serious for polio. Mm. People were dying. A lot of the treatment was very, very limited. And it often affected children severely. And it, it got to the point where the border between New York and New Jersey, they were shutting it down. If you were coming from New York, they wouldn't let you into New Jersey because of the polio epidemic different things like that. So he was very serious. Also, at that time, uh, Pancho Villa was causing problems on our southern border. Our actual town mayor at that time, William Sutphin, was a, a sergeant in uh, you know, Company B of, of the New Jersey National Guard Cavalry. And he was on military duty down, you know, chasing you know, Pancho Villa along the border. So people were I interested now what, what, what's, what's happening with uh, you know, Mayor Sutphin, you know, in his cavalry unit <laughs> down on the border <laughs> with Pacho Villa. In addition to reading about the, you know, the Battle of the Somme that just started around that time right. in July of night. This, this was a horrendous battle, and uh, you know, it, it had effect you know, on a lot of people all over the country. Yeah, I, they would have read about terrible fatalities that were going on, loss of life. So, you know, you think of 1916, I, I think of the town as being sort of a, a little bit sleepy, but hardworking people. Everybody was kind of neighborly. They knew what was going on. They, everybody knew all the gossip and the scuttlebutt around town. It was a simple time in many ways. But yet they had these things on their mind, the polio epidemic and World War I, and are we going to end up getting to that fray? The Lusitania had sunk already and that was uh, you know another sort of a predecessor to our eventual involvement so it was kind of scary but picture it's July you said there's factories in town I would imagine there were a lot of small businesses in town as well what kind of businesses would have been in town in 1916 in Madawan? there were a lot of you know the, the typical shops the shoe shops uh, they did have a small you know department store if you want to do home repairs or things like that, they would have shops like that. But they did not have large department stores that we think of today or malls or anything like that. And many times, if you wanted groceries, you would have your almost like being on the farm. You take your basket and, and you get tomatoes, you, you'd get lettuce and things like that, and you get fresh bread at the bakery. And, and that would be your dinner. Instead of going, you know, like we do today, you know, you shop for a whole week or longer. And you take out your credit card and hope you have enough money. <laughs> 1916, that was back in the day where you could only spend money that you actually had, right? Yes. <laughs> Things the credit changed. era had not arrived. <laughs> exactly. So 1916, there would have been some automobiles around, but I would imagine that there were a lot of still horses and carriages used. So let's talk about recreation. It gets pretty hot in July up here in New Jersey, and the kids would go fishing, and they would also go swimming. Where would they go swimming here in Matawan? Well, actually, we, we do have, in addition to, uh, you know, the, the roads and, and railroads and things like that, we had Matawan Creek. Matawan Creek was a, a tidal creek, actually connected to the ocean, into, into Keyport Harbor, and most people, when they hear the word creek, 
they think of a little mountain creek going over the rocks and things like this. Matawan Creek in those days was about 30, 35 feet wide, but over 30 feet deep oh. at high tide. And they actually had ocean-going sloops and schooners coming into Matawan back at, even in the 18th century. A lot of the corn for George Washington's army came from this area. Really? And so up through that time, and with the development of New York City, there's a lot of clay uh, you know, resources in this area of New Jersey. And we had about five different uh, brick companies, and they would ship through Matawan Creek. And one of the ships there was called the Wyckoff. It was a steam vessel, a cargo vessel, and it would come in and came to an area called the Wyckoff Dock. And they would, they would ship things to New York and back and different things like that. So it, it, it was a very helpful thing to the commerce at that time. It was, but also a place where kids could swim, right? Yes. With the development of the railroad, the, there was less involvement with Matawan Creek as a, as a commercial uh, a type of uh, you know, resource. But uh, the place they would go is theoretically the ocean is not that far away, but a mile and a half to walk, is, it seems like a significant thing. They would go down to Matawan Creek. And there was an area, the Wyckoff actually stopped operating in 1903. So, and there was an old dock there, and it still had pilings and things. Kids could climb up on the pilings and dive into Matawan Creek. It was deep enough, and they could splash around and have a ball. The only problem, it, it became kind of muddy, and it wasn't the, the typical swimming hole we think of today. Kids back in 1916, when it was hot, all they cared about was a good dip in cool water, <laughs> and that's, that's what Matawan Creek provided. You can just picture it back then, and the, the kids jumping in. Now, I have to ask this. Didn't, when the kids went swimming down there, the boys, didn't they go skinny dipping at the time? Yes, they did. The girls would not go near Matawan Creek. It was too dirty and yucky. So the boys would come down there, and they would they'd take their clothes off, hang it on a branch, and they would skinny dip. So they, they would ha have a grand time. You know, this was a time, too, when, uh, when swimming became more open. And even al along the general Atlantic Ocean shore area, there were more cars. And more, the more cars, more people were being transported for the recreation of the ocean. So this was becoming more and more of an activity. But in Little Matawan, uh, it was too much of a, a hassle to go to the ocean with umbrellas and things like that. It's much easier just going down to the, they called it the crick. And they would jump into the crick and splash <laughs> around. That was their sense of fun. Well, this is a perfect segue into a poem that you recited for me. It was a poem that, I guess it dates to some period around the time of... Uh, 1912. Oh, 1912, so 1912, four years before the shark attacks, that sort of stresses the importance of that creek, or a crick, as they uh -huh. called it, to the community. So could you recite a little of that sure. poem for me? It's called The Crick. Some call it crick and others creek, as does the dictionary. To crick I'll stick till river sticks. No more is crossed by ferry. A snake laid out its winding course, according to tradition, that's handed down to present day by folks of erudition. It always fascinated me, since I can first remember I loved it when the year began and ended in December. When I was but a little lad, I'll mention by digression, that I was still in pinafores. It made its first impression. It lured me to Vanessa's dock together with my brother, though after warned to keep away by a most careful mother. Within the crick, I learned to swim, but quite involuntary. A big boy pushed me off the brink, his way of being merry. To a sink or swim, and no mistake, decision came that minute. No time to think I cannot swim when overboard right in it. I splashed with hands and kicked with feet, and made a great commotion, and somehow safely reached the bank, but swallowed half the ocean. I pity those who never bobbed for eels or caught a shiner, and if the catfish should bite good, what sport could there be finer? Oh, Crick, my playground and friend, how much indeed I owe you. Permit me in my feeble way my deference to show you. Today the Crick is near filled up and gone its ancient glory, and someday will come to an end, as does just now my story. Oh, man, that is terrific, Al. First of all, I got to commend you. You did that all by memory. That is great. It gives such a picture of what that creek was like in 1912. Do we know who the author of that poem was? Yes. 
It was a, a local resident, Frank Doolittle. So that's four years before the shark attack. So The year of the Titanic. It is the year of the Titanic. <laughs> another uh, marine history thing to talk about, which we did on one of our previous episodes, <laughs> actually. So now you've painted a picture of 1916 Madawan for us. Let's talk about the main character in your book, Stanley Fisher. But I also wanted to ask you first about Lester Stilwell, one of the two victims here at Madawan, along with Stanley. Who was Lester Stilwell? What was he like? And just generally, what can you tell us about Lester? He came from a working class family. Uh, His father worked at the Anderson Sawmill, a peach basket factory. And it's the same thing with his brothers. And during the summertime, they would uh, help the father, you know, building some of his, uh, his peach baskets. And uh, they went to uh, public school. They were not in sophisticated private schools or things like that. And they, they went to the Methodist church. And uh, they would enjoy the different things in town. They would enjoy sled riding and ice skating in the wintertime and splashing around in places like the creek. But they, they were a typical working class family. They were. Now, in 1916, how old was Lester Stilwell? Lester Stilwell was 11 years old, just about ready to turn 12 when he died. He was. And I understand he had some health problems. Yes. He also had a form of epilepsy where his body would start to shake when he'd have a seizure. Mm. And the people often referred to that as the shakes. And there could very easily have been a situation where, you know, Stanley Fisher may have witnessed this. He had a lot of Uh, concerned individuals around him, his his fellow playmates, if they saw that Lester might be having a fit or something like that, they'd watch out for him. Mm. Because it's one thing if he would have his fit. I was a first aider for a while, and one of our things we would do, prevent someone from hurting themselves if they're having an epileptic seizure. But it's very dangerous when you're in the water. Mm. Because with your movement and things like that, before you could be rescued, you could often drown. So that was one of his, his major problems. Would a lot of the people in Matawan, in the small sort of tight-knit community, would they pretty much have known about Lester's condition? Yes. Okay. Not too much you can hide in a small town. No. Where everybody knows everybody. Yeah, so people were looking out for him, yeah. too. That's they did it in a friendly way. You know, they wanted him to participate. He would play ball and do this. He would go swimming with them, but they would, they would always keep an extra eye out for Lester. But they, they didn't, did not exclude him in any way. They treated him as any other young boy that age. Oh, that's great. Now let's talk about Stanley Fisher, the main character in your book. Who was Stanley Fisher? Well, one thing, he was about six foot one, weighed about 210 pounds, a very good looking man. And, uh, you know, the the girls would kind of eye Stanley Fisher walking down the street. But he had a, a, a kind of a magnetic personality. It wasn't just being a good looking, uh, you know, uh, model type person. Uh, He was concerned about others. He would talk, and he would always be interested in what other people are doing. He was very helpful. He often would use his large size in a protective way. If someone was being picked on or anything like that, Stanley Fisher would be around, watch out. You know, he would look out for the underdog. He was a very, very nice man. He was very religious, too. Uh, He was a beautiful singer. He was a tenor. He was a soloist in the choir in the Methodist church in town. He was also a leader of the Sunday school. And he was very much a family man. His father, Captain Fisher, was uh, the commodore of the Savannah Steamship Line. And uh, his older sister, Augusta, was a very popular girl in town. And Augusta had lost a younger sister between Stanley's birth, uh, who died of pneumonia. The Fisher family was very sad when Florence died. Mm -hmm. And then Stanley came in 1892, and they were so happy that uh, this another child, uh, and a son this time, and uh, everyone doted on Stanley, particularly his older sister, Augusta. They had a wonderful relationship as brother and sister. And Stanley really wanted to share that with other people. When you said that the, the family doted on him, they just really loved on him. But as I read the book, I don't get the sense that he felt entitled or that it, he, he seemed to be a protector. Yes. Uh, so he... The love that was poured into him, he sort of reflected it back, right. on, back on other people, yes. which, which really struck me about this personality. And just re- reading your book, you develop Stanley's personality very well. You talk about the small hometown paper here. You use those resources to sort of tell about what was going on in his life, the, 
sing-along type of things he did in, in, in church, and he developed some, some really good friends in town, but he was, he was very talented in many ways. As you said, he was very athletic and things like that. He did have a girl that he was sweet on. Was it Meta or Mita? Mita, yes. Mita. What, tell us a, a drop about that. Okay. One thing I want to clear up, when I said sometimes the family would do it on, he was never spoiled. He was a very, very up, upfront type guy, a person who looked out for others. He did not expect people to do things for him. He was fortunate because he had a, a healthy build. He was, he was good at sports. Uh, and he, his father was a, a wonderful role model for him. And he had a, a lot of friends in town. And obviously the girls would see Stanley. And Mita Thompson, he, Stanley was also in a singing group called the Quintet. And one of uh, Mita's relatives was in the Quintet. And I think Stanley met via the, that relative. And uh, they started dating. Everything seemed to be falling into place. And uh, so it, it looked like that down the road that they might get engaged. Hmm. But as time went on, it was necessary... Stanley had a change in residence for a while. Well, he actually went to Minnesota. His sister, Augusta, married a man by the name of Arthur Nichols and were living in, in Minneapolis. And so Stanley would visit Minneapolis, and, and he actually went there for a, a significant amount of time, and he started to learn the dry cleaning trade. Dry cleaning trade in the early 20th century was still you know, starting out until they actually developed a non-gasoline-based solvent <laughs> in dry cleaning. Thankfully. <laughs> But he wanted to be part of that. He yeah. wanted to be part of this. And so he was working in Minneapolis for a while. But more and more, he wanted to come back to his hometown of Matawan. He loved the interaction of being in a small town. Oh, that's cool. But when he did come back, he chose to come back to Matawan to work here and be around uh, his friends and family and his hometown. But I, I understand Mita had actually... Uh, Entered in a relationship with one of Stanley's friends. But one of his best friends. One of his best friends. But it was an okay yes. thing, right? It was now, okay. Their, their romance kind of waned with Stanley moving to a different area. And she was dating other people. She started dating Stanley's best friend. And it was all on, on the up and up. It was never a bitter, bitter type thing. They both respected each other. And they, they just realized that, you know, they may, might need more time. And maybe marriage was not really in the, in the cards right for now. Right. And that's where his friend actually started dating. And, and then Stanley was very happy when his best friend proposed to his former girlfriend. So it was a happy story there. Right. And his friend was Kurt yes. Wyckoff, right? Yes. Okay. So when Stanley returned to Matawan from Minnesota, he went into business. Yes. Right? Could you tell us the business? He actually opened up a dry cleaning establishment. And uh, this was uh, new to the area. And everybody was, you know, so happy to have Stanley Fisher back. And he had his customers were very enthusiastic. He was also an outlet for a, a sophisticated clothing line based in, uh, you know, Chicago and New York. So you could come and order a suit, uh, you know, based on their patterns and things like that. A lot of the suits were, they were handmade. You would give your specifications, they take your measurements, they make your suit. And Stanley, his business was doing very well. And he put advertisements in the Matawan Journal about how it's important for a man to have proper clothing and their apparel to be uh, maintained well. And that's what I want to do in town for, for those people who I'd love to help with their clothing. And he was really doing very well. So back then, I understand that there was often a barter system that would take place. And there's a story in your book about a friend of his who didn't have a lot of money, but he was an insurance salesman. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened with that deal? Well, the, the insurance agent, his name was Ralph Gorsline, and they, he was friends with Stanley. They, they knew each other, about the same age, and he was, you know, promoting his business, but he was very cash poor. And so uh, he, he would talk to Stanley, and Ralph actually needed a, a new suit. But the one thing he did have to offer as an insurance agent was to give a policy to someone. And so Stanley, who, since he knew Ralph, said, okay, I'll give you a new suit. And then Ralph said, I'll give you an insurance policy, a life insurance policy. Technically, it was for $10,000, which Stanley kind of considered a joke because he was in great health. Most people at age 24 aren't considering about passing away and how they're going to provide for their, you know, their relatives. But uh, it was kind of a, a nice gesture between friends. Yes, and that, that's going to play into the story down the line here. So, Al, we've now got an idea of 
who Stanley Fisher was. Uh, amazing guy and uh, little Lester Stillwell. We've, we've got an idea of what he was like as well and the village. Take us back now to July 12th, 1916 and the terrible events that occurred down at the Matawan Creek. Yes, this was uh, July 12th, 1916. Typical hot summer day, very humid, and the temperature for that week had been in the 80s, and it was possibly going to go up into the 90s. Uh, Matawan in those days uh, did not have paved streets. The main street actually had a trolley line uh, going right up and down the main street, and uh, in the summertime, it would get very dusty, and they still, they still had horse and buggies. Mm. They were just more and more cars, and even motor trucks were coming in town, but they were still had hitching posts, you know, along the street there, along with the trolley track going, right, going, uh, you know, right up and down the center. So uh, on a typical hot day like uh, July 12th, uh, you know, the people would be working at their jobs. A lot of the young young men would be were we clerking in the stores. Uh, a lot of people would be working in the Madawan House Hotel. The maids would be making the beds. Uh, you know, the, a lot of the men would be taking the beer barrels off the truck for the, their tavern. People would be going to the bakery and going to different shops and, and things like that. And, of course, in a small town, they'd meet their friends and they would gossip. So, uh, and a lot of the, the houses on Main Street had porches. And one of, the, one of the recreational activities was sitting on your porch in the evening and watching your friends walk up and down the street. And you, you walk up and sit on the porch and talk. And, you know, good interaction. Well, m- many times in the summer, if, if the boys who were, you know, working at the, the basket factory you know, done an, enough of what their, their job was for that day. If it was a hot day, they, they could be excused early. And uh, often on a hot day, uh, they, would, they would think about a, a swim down at the, the old Wyckoff Dock on Matawan Creek. And uh, Lester and some of his friends were thinking about that sort of thing. Now, something else is happening simultaneous to this. Th- the boys are thinking about going for a swim in a little while, but Captain Cottrell, who is, uh, was actually born in Matawan, he's a former sea captain who lived in Keyport, uh, and how often he'd walk between Matawan and Keyport. He was actually walking over, after a morning of fishing, he's walking over the trolley bridge over Matawan Creek. And he looks down over the trolley bridge, and he sees a dark eight-foot form going under the bridge. Oh, boy. And having been at sea, he recognized this as the body of a shark. Oh, gosh. Uh, about an eight- or nine-foot shark. And it was moving upstream, heading toward the town of Matawan from the ocean area in, you know, Keyport uh, Harbor. Goodness. And so he immediately realized, oh, oh my God, uh, if anybody comes in contact with that shark, th- this is a serious shark. It's not a little guy. It's, it's a big guy. And so he goes to the, the gatekeeper's little shack at the bottom of the bridge. There weren't that many telephones, but that was one place where they had a telephone. He called uh, the town marshal. The town marshal at that time was man by the name of John Molsoff. He was also a barber in town. Uh, and so he was at his barber shop. That, you know, the marshal was at his barber shop. And he, and, uh, he calls uh, the barber shop. He says, I just saw a shark going up Matawan Creek. It's heading toward Matawan. And John Molsoff kind of chuckles. And a lot of other people in the barber shop can hear it. Shark heading toward Matawan. Yeah, and <laughs> so they're, they're saying, this kind of sounds crazy. And they weren't taking it that seriously. There was something that did happen that, that made people kind of cognizant of sharks. There had been, uh, you know, uh, two other shark attacks in the month. On July 1st in Beach Haven, a man, a young man, Charles Van Sant, w- was actually killed by a shark. And, and July 6th in uh, Spring Lake, which is about 45 miles north of Beach Haven, another man was out swimming and was attacked by the shark. And the shark bit off his two lower legs. And so now the whole area was starting to think about being attacked by a shark. But that was along the ocean. Yeah. This is Matawan. Uh, you know, a mile and a half in on Matawan Creek, which curves and winds around. There couldn't be a shark in Matawan Creek. Mm-hmm. So they weren't taking him very seriously at that point. Okay. So people know that these things happen, but it was, it was at the beach. It couldn't possibly happen here. So they were going about their normal day. So Lester Stillwell decides he's going to go in for a swim with some friends. Can you take us through that? Yeah. Well, at this time, Captain Cottrell are, is very upset with the, the response he got to his warning right. at the barbershop. So he actually gets into a boat and starts heading toward Matawan. But he actually goes past the Wyckoff Dock before the boys even get near the area. 
there were several boys, about six boys all together, gathered together, and they started, they worked at the basket factory, they got together, they started going down to uh, the old Wyckoff dock. And uh, Lester was very proud of himself uh, because he had learned how to float. And he was in the water. He said, hey, fellows, look at me. I'm floating. And the other boys were diving and swimming back and forth. But they, Lester was, they just saw Lester, uh, you know, out there. And then they started heading back to the dock, and they noticed Lester is no longer behind them. Hmm. What happened to Lester? Where's Lester? And all of a sudden, uh, some of the boys had seen, it looked like a submerged log moving toward Lester a few moments before that. And then all of a sudden, this submerged log, which turned out to be a shark, attacks Lester. This young boy lifts him out of the water several times. There's blood all over the place. He's going up and down. And this shark is really doing a number on this young Lester Stillwell. The other boys, there's not that much they can do at this point, and they kind of panic. Lester is now gone. He's underwater. So they come up, and they decide that they're going to get help. They kind of forgot the fact that they were, all of them were in the nude, and they start r- running. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this, the Wyckoff dock was in a lower level right below Main Street. So they start running up, uh, you know, Dock Street, and some went up uh, Water Street to the main thoroughfare of Matawan. And when they got to the Main Street, they, they turned to right. It went right past the train station, went all the way into town shouting, a shark got Lester, a shark got Lester. You know, you, a uh, few weeks ago, my wife Kelly and I came up to visit you, and you took us along the route of where those boys ran from the creek into town. That was a long way. That was not a short pop, skip, and a jump. No, that was a healthy walk. That was a healthy <laughs> walk, and they were running. They were and, running. Yeah. So where is Captain Cottrell now? He's still, he's still trying to tell people about this shark, and nobody's listening. Yes. Unfortunately, he passed the Wyckoff dock before the boys came down. So they didn't hear his warning. Oh. He came into town. He was telling people in town, watch out, there's a shark in Matawan Creek. We've got to tell people this and that. People are kind of ho-humming him, looking at him, thinking that, well, Captain Cottrell was a, a popular guy, but a good storyteller mm-hmm. about his life at sea. Mm-hmm. And they, they were kind of losing sight. Maybe this is just a story and this and that. But they weren't really buying into this. And now all of a sudden, these boys are running, screaming, a shark got Lester. And they run right past Stanley Fisher's tailor shop. And he hears this, and he runs out to the front of his shop. And at first, he's not so sure about you know, the shark reference. But he said, oh, my God, something's happened to Lester. Maybe it was a, a case of uh, you know, uh, his epileptic seizure, something mm. like that, the shakes. And, but I better get down there to see if I can help. So he runs out of his barber shop, and he bumps into two of his friends, uh, Red Burlew and Arthur Smith. So the three of them start going down to the Wyckoff dock to see what they can find. And again, it's no short walk down there. So they ran oh. down there. And again, this is Stanley Fisher and everything that it's in the book and what you've told me. This guy is a natural protector. He's a doer. He is a person who uh, has a protective instinct, especially around Lester. So he's charging down there, just an automatic response from him. So what happens when he gets down to the dock? Once they get to the dock, there's blood all over the place. Mm. It's very obvious that something seriously had happened down there. And at that time, uh, you know, there are few people starting to, to gather down there. And they were very concerned that Lester might still be underwater. He may, may still be alive. They weren't 100% sure that, that he had died. But it, it, it looked pretty likely with blood all over the place. But it was very important to recover the body. And this is uh, one thing that's, uh, you know, kind of interesting about that time period. Uh, you know, they, they really, it was very important for the family to have the body to memorialize and have a funeral service. And they took that very, very seriously. And these men were out in the boat, and they had poles, trying to locate the body by dropping the pole down. Uh, everyone at the, the Wyckoff dock, and now there are about 300 people down there coming from town. And they were, they were saying to these three men, don't go in the water. The shark may still be there. Don't go on the water, whatever you do. These men now, are they've been trying this for about an hour. It's not working. Mm. And now they, they would look over and they'd see the people watching them. Are they going to try to recover Lester's body? And Stanley was the type of man that if he knew the people were relying on him, he wasn't going to let the people down. No. And it, he tried one last dive. He was in the water night, put on you know, swimming trunks. The funny thing about the swimming trunks in those days, they were like long underwear, black long underwear. And if you're splashing around in a, in a male swimming outfit, uh, you look very much like a seal. 
you know, just, just by the way you look. But he was, he's making one last dive down, and then at the bottom of Matawan Creek, he locates Lester's body. And just about that time that he's bringing the body back, Arthur Smith feels this searing pain across his midsection. And now they realize that's the shark. It's heading full force towards Stanley. Oh, no. And it's, it, it, it latches onto Stanley's upper leg, uh, his right upper leg between the knee and the, and the hip, and holds on for fear of dive. It, with the attack, he lets go of Lester's body because it does an impact, and Lester slips away from him. But now he's fighting the shark. So being a powerful, strong guy, still no match for a large shark. They're in the shark's turf. Yeah. And so Stanley, if he, he might be able to do quite a bit on land or even in the water on his own terms. A shark in the water is a, a particularly a shark that's about, you know, seven and a half, eight, nine feet long, is a very serious contender, weighing hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Yeah. So now Stanley's been bitten by this shark, and... How does he get out of the water? What happens? They okay. pull him out. What happens? There are other people there. There are men in a boat close by, and they see that he's attacked. And Stanley is, is fighting the shark. He's, he's pounding with his fist. He's doing everything he can. He's a big man, but the shark has is, is taken him down twice underwater. And now the, the men are coming over in the boat, and they're hitting the shark with their oars and things like that. And they're finally able to get Stanley into the boat. And Stanley is, is bleeding profusely. In fact, uh, there were uh, several people, you know, watching him. There was a, a stream of blood went up from his leg because the, uh, the shark had severed an artery. Mm. And it was a really a gruesome scene. And at that time, often when you have a severe injury like that, you don't feel the pain right away. Mm. And he, he's, a lot of the nerves have been, you know, damaged. And so now the blood is going up in the air. And Stanley looks down and he says, oh, my God, when he sees his own mutilated leg. And they, they finally put a tourniquet on him in the boat. And they're able to get him onto the dock. But they're still trying to locate a doctor. There wasn't a doctor standing. They're ready for this. So they, they're going around town looking for a doctor. And, and he's on the dock there. He's still conscious. And he's talking to people. And finally, Dr. Reynolds comes down and puts a better tourniquet. The, the original tourniquet had, had burst. And they put another tourniquet on. They're trying to decide now how to get medical. They didn't have medevac helicopters in those days. Oh. This is 1916. And he definitely had, had to have, with his artery severed, and blood all over the place, he, he had to have real treatment at a hospital. There were two possibilities. One was uh, St. Peter's Hospital up in New Brunswick, but that would have to be by car. And Stanley's condition, they, they didn't think he could make it in a car. Oh. The roads weren't paved. The other was going up to the railroad station, going down to Long Branch, Monmouth Memorial Hospital in Long Branch. So they decided to do that. They improvised the stretcher and put him on the stretcher and carried him up to the train station. That train station was another site that you took us to when we were visiting here before. And while it wasn't that far away from the Wyckoff dock, it was still kind of a distance to be carrying a, a big man. So I would imagine it was a group effort to carry him up there and to catch that train. I think it was the 506. 506. It was the 506, <laughs> but they had to wait for a train yes. when somebody is basically bleeding out. So they got him on the train, and what happened then? Well, one thing, actually from the dock up to the train station, one of Stanley's best friends, Willie Shepard, uh, years before that there was an accident where Willie had fallen off uh, Stanley's uh, shoulders and hit his head uh -huh. and they, they joked about it because he wasn't you know he was unconscious for a while but it wasn't a serious injury but now willie shepherd is with stanley kind of a reversal of roles with the friends oh yeah he's with stanley and he's going up the hill he's carrying Stanley the hill and dr reynolds asked for a volunteer to ride the train down to long branch or willie willie just volunteers to go with stanley so these two old friends are on the on the train Stanley's still conscious. He's talking to Willie. He's talking about he found Lester at the bottom of the creek. And Willie is trying you know, to calm him down so he doesn't, you know, his bleeding doesn't get worse. So it's, it's kind of a strange reunion of these two friends in this crisis situation. Did Stanley say anything? Did he have any last words? Well, he, on the train, he was, he was telling, uh, you know, Willie about finding Lester's body and things like that. When they actually got him to the hospital, in kind of record time, they were you know avoiding some of the you know, the local stops. They where they kind of didn't express in there. They were going to have to amputate his leg, but they were getting ready to take him into the op operating room. At this time, Stanley was through shock and loss of blood. He was getting very very weak. 
But uh, Dr. Field, who was uh, the attending surgeon, was there, and, uh, and he said Stanley wanted to say something to him. Mm-hmm. So Dr. Field went close to Stanley, and Stanley was able to mouth these words. I got Lester away from the shark. Oh. I did my duty. Oh. And he died. That was it. Totally consistent with the character of the man that you so wonderfully explain in your book. That's very moving because that's what he was about. That's what the man was about. And he wanted to get that body. And it, 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 he knew, Stanley knew that Lester at that point was dead, that this was just a recovery process. But he had that much respect for the family and that child that he was willing to risk his life just to give Lester's family peace of mind. And that's, uh, that's really a touching, touching story. So Stanley has passed away, and Lester's body, when was Lester's body actually recovered? Okay, a couple days later. The people down by the the creek were were actually looking for revenge. They wanted to kill that shark. Mm. And they also wanted to recover Lester's body. They were setting off dynamite charges in the lake. They were putting netting, uh, wire netting, so that uh, the the shark, they were afraid that the the shark was going to carry Lester's body out to Raritan Bay Mm -hmm. and then never see it again. Mm -hmm. They wanted to, you know, keep the shark in that area, the shark in that area. Uh, So they're putting the netting down there. And at that time, there was a heavy rain, although they weren't really succeeding. This was on on the the 13th. There was a heavy rain the night of the 13th. And that actually, uh, in fact, Stanley's parents were away from town at that time. They were visiting the daughter in Minneapolis. And uh, the acting mayor, Eris Henderson, had sent a telegram saying that Stanley had passed away. But they didn't say how he died. Oh. And so the, the Fisher family, you know, decided they, they got, got on the train and were heading past. And they actually, while they were tra- changing trains in Chicago, saw a Chicago Tribune newspaper. It said, talked about the Madawan shark attack. That's how they found that how Stanley had died. He oh. was killed by the shark. And oh. at that time, Augusta uh, Fisher Nickel, she was pregnant. <laughs> oh. And so, you know, it was the worst thing in the world, you know, being pregnant, hearing something like that about her beloved brother had been killed by a shark. And so now they're continuing to head on to, uh, you know, to Matawan. They're trying to wander. Captain Fisher was a sea captain. They're trying to figure how could this happen? How could a shark come up Matawan Creek like this? But now that, that's what they were thinking of. I can imagine the horror, first of all, of, of finding out that your 24-year-old son is, has died, and then to find out in a newspaper how and what a horrible way. That must have been really traumatic. So it's, what is it now, July 14th? He said the morning after this rain, did okay. they find yes, Lester's body? Yes, actually, the, uh, Lester's body surfaced. There, were, uh, there was an, an engineer and a railroad worker walking to work, and they're walking by Madawan Creek near the train trestle. And they look over and they see this, this object bobbing up and down. And they walk down and they realize that's Lester's body. Mm. So the, the rain had helped lift the, the body up. And so they took the body and the town coroner, you know, authorized their movement of the body. And, and Lester had been attacked several places by the shark. You know, his, his limbs and his, his intestines and his shoulders and his, one of his ankles had been bitten off. But it was interesting, his face was untouched. So... It's sad to note that he, that, you know, that he was in this condition, but at least the Stillwell family had Lester back yeah. so they could now have a burial, and that's one thing that they were very happy with. But the, the, the one strange thing here, the shark incident isn't quite over yet because uh, the shark actually had gone and uh, had attacked another group of boys who were swimming. Uh, there was uh, you know, Joseph Dunn, Michael Dunn, and Jerry Hoorahan from Madawan were swimming there, and... Uh, once the shark had attacked Stanley, uh, Captain Cottrell had been going up the creek shouting, a, you know, a shark attack in Matawan, get out of the water. And these boys were, were getting, starting to get out of the water. The two older boys, uh, Michael and Jerry, got out first. The younger boy, the smallest boy, uh, you know, Joseph Dunn, was on his way climbing up the ladder. Just as he was climbing up the ladder, the shark grabbed his leg, pulled him back into a deep part of Matawan Creek. Oh. And so now, you know, Joseph is fighting for his life. Here's where courage comes in. Uh, the two older boys jump back in the water. And they start, it's a tug of war. They're pulling uh, Joseph away from the shark. And at the, in the meantime, Captain Cottrell is coming up. There's also a lawyer in Captain Cottrell's boat. His name is Jacob Lefferts. Jacob Lefferts 
dives in the water and helps the boys. Oh. And now they're pulling this tug of war. Oh. The shark is pulling one day. Poor Joseph is in the middle. And finally, they're able to get him away from the shark. And uh, Captain Cottrell takes Joseph back toward the Matawan Wyckoff Dock area. Now, Joseph has, has a, a severe wound to his, his lower leg. It's kind of shredded. But fortunately, the artery wasn't severed. So they're able to secure his wound a little bit more. And if they figure, if they, without infection, maybe they get him to the dock, he might be all right. So they take him back to the Wyckoff Dock. Dr. Reynolds is up at the train station uh, helping Stanley. But a uh, doctor from Keyport was there and was helping Joseph Dunn. And he, he actually decided that uh, in Joseph's case, he could go to St. Peter's Hospital because he didn't have the arterial right. bleeding like Stanley. So they take him, they put him in a car, and they take him up to St. Peter's Hospital. In fact, Joseph Dunn was from New York, and he didn't want to tell where his street address was because he was afraid his mother would find out about it. He didn't want his mother to know until he could you know, soften the story. It was kind of a cute little you know, a tidbit to the side, sidelight of this. Thankfully, he survived. He Joseph survived. Dunn. He was the only survivor of this attack. You know, the, the one man died in uh, Beach Haven, the other one in Spring Lake, and now two, uh, Lester Stilwell and Stanley, in Matawan. It was still considered one of the worst shark attacks in U.S. history. And Joseph Dunn, where he was swimming, where he was attacked, was not actually in the Matawan Creek, was it? Where was it? It was in Matawan Creek, oh, okay. but it was between Matawan and Keyport in the Cliffwood area. Okay. So technically, it was outside of the, the border of Matawan Borough, but in the in the general area, that right. it, it's all part of kind of conglomerated together there. But a lot of people often remembered the strictly the Matawan thing because it actually happened in Matawan. But later on, they they, they learned more about the incident that happened uh, with Joseph Dunn. And then yeah. you can see the whole story now. The whole story. So, a total of five people attacked within uh, a short amount of time in July 1916. One person survives, four pass away. I want to talk about the aftermath in Matawan. So we had spoken before, and, and, and it's mentioned in your book as well, that the funerals of Lester Stilwell and Stanley Fisher took place on the same day. Yes. And they were both buried in the same cemetery. Yes, and within view of each other. Uh, can you t talk to that a bit? It was, it was kind of interesting. But there, were, there are two types of, of, of funerals. They both happened on July 15th. Lester's funeral was earlier in the day. And Stanley's funeral was later in the day. And it, it was kind of interesting that uh, you know, Lester, his family members, and a lot of his friends appeared, and of church members. It was a smaller thing. It was at the, the, actually at the Stillwell House mm. on Church Street. Stanley's uh, funeral... Stanley was a very, very popular man in town. So he had a much larger contingent there. And it was actually held in the Aerosmith Undertaking Parlor on Main Street. Uh, it was interesting. At Lester's funeral, one of Stanley's best friends, uh, Court Wyckoff, sang. One of the songs they sang was, uh, at Lester's funeral was Safe in the Arms of Jesus. Mm. And that was a hymn that was often sung at the death of a child. Yeah. It was a very, very sad affair. Then Stanley's funeral was later in the day, and they actually had a viewing, and then they went out. They actually had two services, a second service at the cemetery. And as you were mentioning, as I showed you at the cemetery, Stanley's grave is located almost directly above Lester's grave. It's almost even in death. Stanley is kind of looking out for Lester, who's on a lower level in the cemetery. Yeah, we stood there at uh, Stanley Fisher's grave, and we could see... Little Lester Stilwell's grave from from that point. So that's, that's a great. ten acre cemetery too. So that to be that close, it's just an amazing thing. Coincidence or what? Or maybe not a coincidence. Yeah, and those those sites are still there, and people can go visit and pay their respects. So obviously, both families are devastated. The Fisher family actually because of that bartering deal we spoke about earlier about the insurance policy that uh, Stanley felt he probably didn't need at all. He actually did need it. It did come into play, and it turned into a memorial for him. Could you talk about that, yes. Al? It was actually the day of the funeral. The parents had no idea that Stanley had this policy. Ralph Gorsline approached uh, you know, uh, Captain and Mrs. Fisher and said, I'm so sorry about Stanley. Uh, I have something to t explain to you. 
And first, the Fisher said, this isn't the time for this. Yeah. And he, but he said that Stanley had an insurance policy, and Mrs. Fisher was the beneficiary of the policy. It was a $10,000 policy paying out 7500 at that time of his death. And they, they were kind of shocked. They actually thought about this for a while, and uh, they, they figured they would use this money. Since Stanley was so involved in uh, the Methodist Church, they decided to buy a stained glass window for the Methodist Church in memory of Stanley. Very nice. And they, they called it eventually the Bethlehem window, which they, it was positioned in the front of the church, so the setting sun would always come through that window to remind people of Stanley Fisher. That's, that's a beautiful story. So, Al, how did the events of that day, of that fateful day, how did that impact the small town of Matawan, New Jersey? Well, the, the amazing thing was, I often think of the Matawan shark attack kind of like Matawan's 9-11. Hmm. It impacted this town in such a degree. Everyone knew Stanley Fisher. Everyone knew Lester. And now all of a sudden this invading shark comes in in, the, in their small town, and now two people are dead. It's such a traumatic a type of thing. And uh, the Fisher window, it, it would take a while. It was actually dedicated in 1918, almost two years later, but people would gather together uh, in the barber shop or in saloons or uh, at the, you know social gatherings in the firehouses, and they talk about this. It's hard to put this away, and also for the Fisher family, this is a very close knit family. Sure. So, uh, particularly for Augusta Fisher, all of a sudden Stanley, you know, she wrote a poem about when Stanley died that uh, they weren't able to be with him when he died, uh, and how horrible it was that he he never had a chance to say goodbye. And it's such a sad thing for this, this close-knit family. And uh, a lot of people in the town had the same feeling. And Augusta was Stanley's sister. sister. Okay, so that was the impact really right after the event, the impact on the town of Matawan. How about today, Al? What, the average person here in, in Matawan who's walking around, do many people, you think, know about that attack? I know there's a beautiful memorial in town that was dedicated back in 2016 at the 100th anniversary of the shark attacks, which is really nice. And I'm sure people see it and it's, it's very self-explanatory. I understand you had a big part in that as well, which is great. But do you think a lot of people in this town know about what happened? Well, more people know about it now. I've got to you know, explain to you, I came to Matawan pre-Jaws, <laughs> uh, yes. and a, a lot of the interest of uh, w what happened here and what happened as a result of it and the impact happened after people seeing the movie Jaws. In the movie Jaws, the man who is the scientist, you know, with Captain Quint on his ship, basically said about, about the attack that happened with five people were attacked, referring to the Matawan shark attack. And so with that, Jaws and, and the movies that subsequent to that, movies and books written about the shark attack. So more people now know about it. But when I first came to Matawan, if you said, uh, you know, shark attack, people kind of look at you. It, it Jaws yeah. kind of, you know, shook everybody up. And now people were being very interested in this sort of thing. And it, it even goes on today, all the way through that, uh, you know, a lot of the things, once we get into the, the summer weather, you see shark movies and you see references to uh, the Matawan shark attack, and uh, they talk about Stanley Fisher and Lester Stilwell. Actually, I, I was in a documentary movie that actually has been sent to different parts of the world, the English-speaking world, and often I'll get requests or comments from people in all over the place because I'm in the movie, and it also mentions that I'm a historian and author, and so all people have connect there, and they find out who I am, and I, they'll, they'll communicate with me. It's amazing what happened in this town has spread out, really, all over the country, in fact, one little story, I was in London, England, and uh, I was checking into a hotel, and I signed my name, and I put my, put my address down as Matawan, New Jersey, and the manager happened to be standing right next to the clerk, and the manager said, oh, the shark attack. So, Al, it's interesting that you talk about the interest in the 1916 shark attacks outside of New Jersey. In London, certainly, is uh, very far outside of New Jersey. <laughs> But when Kelly and I were doing some research to do this podcast, we came across a Facebook page that is called 1916 New Jersey Shark Attacks. And 
we got in touch with the administrator of that page thinking that it's a New Jersey boy. And it was not. He was from Tennessee. <laughs> so there's a great interest in that story and what happened here in Matawan and at the other locations at you know Spring Lake and uh, Beach Haven. And when we spoke to Justin Pratt, he just finished reading your book, and he had a few questions for you. So I'm going to play a portion of my conversation with him and give you the opportunity to respond to his questions. So let's listen to what Justin had to say. Welcome, Justin. Thank you, James. Good to be here. We came across this Facebook community called the 1916 New Jersey Shark Attacks. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is cool. So let's contact this person who really runs this group and find out, you know, what do they know about the shark attacks? Do they know any other people who might be experts and might, we may be able to interview? Well, we found Justin Pratt. And I'll be honest with you, I thought you were a New Jersey boy. <laughs> <laughs> and you are not. Is that correct? No, sir. I live in Knoxville, Tennessee. How does somebody from Knoxville, Tennessee get so interested in the 1916 New Jersey shark attacks? Well, it began, of course, uh, the way that so many enthusiasts do with the movie Jaws. I mean, that's, that's obviously uh, what started everything. But uh, reading 12 Days of Terror, Fernicola's book, seeing documentaries like yourself, I read the Capuza book, you know, read various different accounts and everything like that. And so one thing led to another. And before you know it, you're doing your own research. You're doing genealogies on the one survivor, the Dunn family. You're doing all these various different things. And so uh, you kind of just get immersed in looking into the story. The fascinating aspect about this attack was that not only the, the path the shark took, but the fact that it went into a tidal inlet, a uh, creek, if you will, and, uh, and the fact that it, it attacked this person, Stanley Fisher, who was trying to save another victim. And so some of the things that happened here were unheard of, of course, at that time, especially, but today uh, they're still unheard of. Are you generally a person interested in history? Is that one of your favorite things? Oh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. I love your podcast. I think that, uh, you know, not only history, of course, is important for us to know about the future, but it's just a tremendous subject. The uh, personal stories, the, you know, the way it all weaves together. I uh, love it. Yes. Now, when you started this group, this Facebook community, did you start it just on your own or were there other people you already knew of who would be interested in joining it? There was uh, a, a couple of people, um, again, um, myself and a, and a fellow named James Stone, we followed for Nicola, but um, primarily I wanted to establish it for people who were, you know, like-minded, interested in, in the, uh, the account of the 1916 shark attacks. I also established it in the hopes that maybe uh, someone from one of the families might at some point reach out and relay what information they knew. But uh, unfortunately, it, it appears that the with the Dunn family, the last victim, the one that survived, he didn't have any children and his brother who saved him uh, never talked about it. But one thing leads to another, leads to another. And of course, again, it's just a, a, a wonderful, uh, well, it's a tragic account in history, but it's also, there are some inspirational stories like Stanley's, uh, someone who risked their life to uh, save another. Yes, definitely. Now, Justin, I understand you've never been up to New Jersey. Is that true? It actually is. Yes. I've, I've never actually been to New Jersey. What's sad is, is up to this point, my knowledge of the uh, actual places has been confined to books, YouTube, a lot of YouTube, um, a lot of people have been there and recorded their, their uh, experiences there, kayaking, things like that, showing the sites. But no, uh, outside of newspapers that I, I've collected, outside of um, uh, books, outside of video and pictures that you've sent me, mm -hmm. I've not been there. Ah, uh, well, now I got to tell you, Justin, I'm from New Jersey and I have been to Tennessee. So we wanted to get you up here 
And I would love to go with you to some of the sites from the 1916 shark attacks. So, so you can really picture what it was like back then, uh, based on all that information that you have about it. Absolutely. That's definitely something that I'm going to have to remedy soon. <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that, Justin. Yes, sir. Okay. So we are speaking with Madawan historian, Al Savalane. And Al has written a book about Stanley Fisher uh, specifically and his role as a hero who tried to, as you had mentioned before, had tried to rescue little Lester Stilwell. And you've got the book and I know you've read it. Yes. What questions do you, as a, a real enthusiast, somebody who's very well read and very curious about those events of 1916, what questions do you have for Al Savalane about Stanley Fisher and his role in those events? Well, first of all, I just want to say I absolutely love the book. And, um, and I think it was a wonderful work. It is a period of a bygone time where people helped people without any, um, without any pretense. They just immediately jumped in. Uh, I did love that. But I do have some questions that, I, that I've written down, and uh, I think that uh, maybe Al could try to answer them. Uh, the first one would be, uh, he wrote in his book that the, the window that was donated uh, in memory of Stanley Fisher by his family was auctioned off in the 1970s. There was a memorial window with a Bethlehem scene. And so I was wondering if possibly he would know the location of, of that, or if he would know uh, any way to find out who was auctioned off to from the church. It's a beautiful stained glass window, and it's uh, sad that it's been lost to time. But I hope whoever has it knows exactly what they have. Definitely. Great. And uh, what is your next question, Justin? Well, um, in the book, uh, he, had, um, he listed Stanley's friend, uh, Kurt Wyckoff, who had um, married Meta Thompson, who was kind of Stanley's younger girlfriend, but when Stanley went away, uh, they just, uh, you know, they got married. My question is, is Kurt Wyckoff, is that any relation to the Wyckoff steamer and the Wyckoff dock? Because you have, um, well, the Wyckoff dock was the dock that the boys jumped off of. Uh, it was already in a decaying state back in 1916. Uh, today, the only things left are some uh, trestles or pylons, if you will, sticking up out of the water. Um, and they're, they're rotting and you only see them at low tide. So I was wondering if Kurt Wyckoff is in relation to the dock. Great question. And then the other question I had was, I was absolutely shocked in the book. This is something that, that Fernicola doesn't mention. Certainly something Capuza doesn't mention, but he says that they looked for Lester for one hour before the shark attacked Stanley. And I, I could not believe that, that it was that long. And so I was wanting to know how he, how he found that part out because I mean, that essentially means the shark had kept Lester for that period of time when Stanley finds Lester and then the shark attacks Stanley. That's a really good question. Cause that an hour is a long time. That is for very sure. Good. And that, that shark must've been obviously lurking around where Lester went down. Yeah, but see, that's the, you know, you, you get to a certain point when you read all the stuff and you see all the documentaries, you think, well, there's not a whole lot more new material you can, you can find. But then Al's book, I, I'd, I'd never heard that part. So that was, uh, that was, that was really something amazing there. Um, I also wanted to uh, comment on how tragic it was that Al said this in the book, and this was also a new piece of information that Captain Fisher and his wife, Stanley's parents, discovered his manner of death via the newspaper. You know, they knew he had passed away, but they didn't know how yet. And so they discovered their son, their only son, dies via shark attack. Uh, I just thought that was uh, particularly a tragic aspect of the story. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I read the book as well, and um, that's just a terrible way to find out when you think of it. They just happened to stop and get all of that paper. Yeah. Uh, I just, 
talking about um, the aspect of the fact that a insurance man traded a insurance policy for a suit is again, I think, um, indicative of the fact that this is a, a time that has left us. This is a time long since gone. But uh, as tragic as it is, I am glad that uh, that that took place because it does it gives us an idea of what things were like back then. And again, it allowed the family to be able to be more comfortable and to purchase that window. Definitely, definitely. I, I was taken by that as well. I imagine now if I had to call up my insurance agent and say, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I got a suit upstairs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can yeah. I get a good uh, term life policy from that? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Did you, you have know, any other questions, Justin? Well, um, in essence, I, I found the book to be something that was, uh, again, it, it represented um, the aspects of, it focused on this this bygone era, as, the, as is in the title. It focused on being a hero, sacrificing for your friend. And um, the fact that, you know, again, every other book out there, and, and, I, and I do, I enjoy the, the Fernicola book uh, tremendously. Uh, I love debating on what kind of shark it is. It was a white, by the way. <laughs> uh, but uh because they can they can survive in that brackish high salt water content that was taking place in 1916 that creek was so salty but anyway i particularly like the fact that he takes this different angle and he's focused on the personal stories that the way it affected the city or the town the way it affected uh the families and you know who these people were because i mean sometimes the biggest thing is sometimes, you know, we get so far removed from it that we almost become uh, a numb to the fact that these were real people. They had real families and, and real loved ones. And so as, as exciting as it is and as, uh, as interesting as the story is, these were real people that suffered and went through a terrible tragedy. And it affected them, their families, and the town for, what is it, 100 years after yeah. So, um, you know, the thing is, is, is that his book focuses on that aspect. And I, I just thought it was tremendous. Al will be very appreciative of that. And he, he knows about you. He knows about your group. And I know he's very excited about that. And uh, it's a passion for him. And he is going to be addressing your questions. Thank you for your enthusiasm. It's just fantastic. And the fact that you've got a, a community out there on Facebook that is, is also studying this event. And of course, we're, we're in the summer season here in New Jersey mm -hmm. and the Jersey shore, as we call it, is lighting up with people. And I'm just wondering how many people are walking around in Matawan or at Beach Haven or at Spring Lake don't really know or never heard of what what happened there, what kind of events occurred back in 1916 in July mm -hmm. in those places. So I want to ask you, Justin, what kind of things do you have uh, hope for, for your community group? Are you uh, going to continue to do some research? Maybe you'll write a book someday? <laughs> well, I think the, the, the biggest thing is... Um we kind of sort of come to a point where you've read everything you get your hands on. I thought I had until again, I read Al's book. And so that was why it was such a treat. My hope is, is that again, we continue to teach about this particular incident. Sharks are not uh, villains. This is really an isolated incident in history mm. because again, uh, having those five attacks within uh, a 12 day period going from Beach Haven to Spring Lake and then uh, up into Matawan Creek. And then eventually, I believe the shark was captured in Raritan Bay by Michael Slicer. It's a unique account. Beyond that, I would want people to enjoy the page. I would want people to um, understand that sharks are, are not to be demonized. This particular shark, Kapuza and several others think maybe something might have been wrong with it. And uh, again, we have bad people. And we don't go around, you know, exterminating people. Uh, sharks are obviously important to the ecosystem, things like that. But uh, outside of that, you know, just have fun with the page. If you find out anything or find a piece of memorabilia, you know, I guess my biggest hope outside of just having fun with it and interacting with people would be 
Uh, maybe there'll be a break at some point. Maybe someone will say, hey, I have uh, the jaws of the Raritan white. You know, my, I found it in my uncle's attic. Or uh, I, my you know, grandmother bought the Fisher window and uh, I just found this page. So I guess I would hope that maybe sometime there will be a break and we'll find something, uh, one of the historical items uh, that are you know gone. Other than that, just have fun with it. Uh, just be able to talk about it and, uh, and be able to remember. Uh, be able to remember the sacrifice of, uh, of a good man like Stanley. Uh, greater love hath no man that laid his life down for his friend. Amen. Amen to that. Well, Justin, thank you so much. And um, I know you're going to be coming up to New Jersey at some point. Please let me know. We'll get together. Right. We'll go see those sites together. Absolutely. Sooner rather than later. <laughs> okay. Thanks for being on our show, Justin. Thank you, sir. Okay. Have a great day. You too. So, Al, let's talk about the questions that Justin brought up and see how you do with answering them. Okay. You want to give it a shot? Sounds great. Okay. Justin's first question was about the memorial window that was purchased by Stanley Fisher's family with the insurance proceeds. He'd like to know what, what happened to that window? you mentioned it's auctioned off in the book. Where did it go? Do you know? Uh, you have to understand that, uh, when the church was demolished for structural reasons, this was in 1970. This was even before Jaws. Mm. And so the idea of shark attacks and this and that and the special character of this window didn't mean anything. Mm. When I say auctioned off, it was more likely auctioned off to a construction company for raw material as opposed to a theme window. Got it. It, it would, wouldn't mean anything to anyone unless you really have gone through everything we're talking about here. Actually, we've tried to find if, if by str some strange thing, maybe it was auctioned off, we've had absolutely no luck finding anything. So that likely, by, by now, we would certainly find out that if, if someplace that window is located, you could go buy it or see it. it I think it's in several pieces all over the place, yeah. would be my guess. That's a shame. That's a shame. So the next question is, Kurt Wyckoff, the friend of Stanley Fisher who, who married Mita Thompson. The name Wyckoff, any relationship to the steamer Wyckoffs or the Wyckoff dock people? Well, one thing I have to mention that the Wyckoff dock was an operation back in the middle part of the 19th century, so quite a bit before anything happening. Wyckoff is a very common name in this part of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So uh, to say that maybe in a distant relationship, there might have been something but there's nothing that I've been able to come across to say, well, but this is my, my great, great, great grandfather that was doing the, you know, the Wyckoff uh, cargo vessel. Nothing like that has ever come up. Another question here from Justin. In the book, you say that they looked for Lester's body for about an hour before Stanley was actually attacked by the shark. Seems like a, a long time that that took. It seems strange that it took that long and that the shark was still hovering in that area. Well, one thing you've got to understand, in those days when we talk about these men diving down, they didn't have scuba equipment or anything like that. They were taking a, a deep breath type of situation going down, and it was muddy. So it wasn't a case. You could even be very close. Sharks can smell people a long way off, mm. but humans can't. So, you know, if you're in the muddy water, you could be very close to a body and not locate it. They were basically groping, blindly groping down. They really couldn't see down there. So uh, there's a possibility that Lester wasn't too far from where, where actually it, it happened. And plus, they're running out of air. So as soon as they run out of air, now they start to think of getting back up and breathing. So they could have been close but missed it. Lester's still being in the area, but they just didn't find it. I see. And also the, the fact the shark was still around yes. an hour later is kind of incredible. How were you able to find that information out about that length of time? Do you have any, uh, any idea about your references there? Or? Well, mo most of the references, there was a, a lot of newspaper coverage ah, okay. at that time. where you know, The articles were, were literally people from Matawan talking about things happening in Matawan. It wasn't somebody from uh, you know, California talking about it. Exactly. But uh, this was people who lived here. And the, the descriptions were very, very accurate. And uh, this was in the area. And people were still very nervous. When these guys came, went down, something could happen. To them. And obviously it did. 
if the shark is in the area and they, they may watch you for a moment doing something, but then they, they, get, they do more than watch you. Oh, and they God. think that maybe you're going at, you're another shark or another, another predator going after Lester's body. And now they're going to protect their find in Lester. And so that could very likely have happened considering the nature of shark attacks. That is a really good explanation because you're right. I mean, the body was there, but it wasn't until, I guess, Stanley got close enough, because he was, he was. Now he, yes, he, he found did. the body. He, he actually found it. And, oh, mine. This is mine, you know? Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah, really good research there, Al, <laughs> and a really great explanation to Justin's question. So, Al, one of the other things that Justin commented on was sort of the picture of a bygone era that you paint in your book so well. And it really just talks about how people looked after each other. It's really a story of heroism and sacrifice and personal stories. And I think that's one of the things that really struck Justin the most was how you turned it into a story. You talked about the personal side of it. I know there's a lot of interest in what type of a shark did the attacks and things like that. And that's all very interesting but you did really come in from the angle of personal stories and getting to know the town of Madawan, the people, the atmosphere, and the victims and who they were and why they acted the way they did. So I know he, he thought very highly of that, and he thoroughly enjoyed your book. On behalf of both of us, I want to thank you for your book. Al, what inspired you to actually put this all down in, in a book. I mean, you're, you're good at giving talks to people. You give tours at Rose Hill Cemetery in Matawan. You're also, I believe, the vice president at yes. the cemetery, and you took us up through there. I'm the historian, too. And you're the historian. <laughs> charming, charming place, it really is. I mean, I know people get weirded out by cemeteries, but I, I'm like you. I, I look at it as a place of history and stories about people, and I think that's a wonderful thing. But what actually inspired you to put it down into a book? Well, the one thing that uh, was very important to me, especially with the shark attack and the, the people involved in the shark attack, uh, one thing as a biographer, you have to be very careful because you, you can, it's very easy to become subjective and uh, you know, feel you know, very much close to the person. And as a biographer, I try to be objective but the more that I was studying uh, these different people, I felt many times, in fact, sometimes when I was writing my book, I, was, I would actually have a camp stool, and I'd be sitting out by Stanley's grave, and I'd be thinking to myself when I'm talking to myself, but I'm, I'm saying this at his grave, that, uh, you know, that you get a personal attachment in that sense, that the, these weren't just a, a figure that you studied about in a museum. These were real people, and now you're sitting at the grave of that person. I've, I've been a singer in my time, but many times I'd be sitting by the grave and something would come to my mind, uh, a song. And then all of a sudden in my research, I find out that was one of Stanley Fisher's favorite songs. Wow. <laughs> no <laughs> and, kidding. You, know, you could say, well, that's, that's your mind. You're, you're creating things you'd like to happen. But you have to, like I said, you have to be on guard that you don't get too personal. I can honestly say this. I was a professional educator. I was a military officer. I know how to be objective when I have to. And I could say that in all of the, my research on Stanley Fisher, and I'm trying to find something, you know, this sounds very good, but w what's the bad side of Stanley Fisher? I couldn't find the bad side of Stanley Fisher. He was a very noble young man who risked his life. He had everything in the world going for him. He was good looking. He was a bright guy. He was successful. He had a wonderful family. And he risked all of it to try to help another individual. And I can't think of a better thing that in life that... Uh, uh, he lost his life, but he, there was a meaning to his life, and he, uh, that's who he was. Well, I think it's beautiful, and, and that, is, that was your inspiration to really write this all down, right? It was Stanley Fisher, really, wasn't yes. it? Yes, I, I wanted to, you know, uh, I, I'm 76 years old, and I have health issues, mm. and I just wanted some of the things that I learned I wanted to share, that I would not be able to do cemetery tours or things like that or be around anymore. The ideas are just, it's such a good story. I want to, it's a feel-good story. And even, how could a shark attack be a feel-good story? But when you learn about the people, how they cared about each other, mm. that's the feel-good part. I think we need more of that today. I agree with you. To just get a story out like this, it happened over 100 years ago, 106 years ago. <laughs> 106 years ago. 
but these people come alive in your book. It's a short read, but it is very impactful and it's it's enjoyable because it's informative, but it's inspiring by the courage that people showed uh, and the love for each other. So thank you for writing this book, Stanley Fisher, Shark Attack Hero of a Bygone Age. How can people get a hold of a copy of your book? Well, one method is uh, if you uh, go on Google and you, you, there will be information about how to order the, the book. I've decided to donate all of my proceeds for the book to the Madawan Historical Society. And because I didn't, I didn't write this book for profit, I wrote it as a, a self-fulfilling type thing, a sharing type thing. And that's what, uh, that'd be the best avenue. If you have difficulty in making arrangements, you can always uh, email me. And <laughs> as long as I'm around, I'll be happy to talk about it or to help you get a book. Sure. And, and what is your email, Al? It's savillane at hotmail.com. And that would be S-A-V as in Victor... O-L-A-I-N-E? Yes. At? Hotmail.com. Hotmail.com. Al, I want to thank you so much for the hospitality you have shown us while we were down here in Matawan, for the tours that you've taken us on, but mostly for your contagious enthusiasm to tell stories, which is what our podcast is all about. And it's about people. It's about stories. And it's about an, an incredible event that happened such a long time ago. But you've brought it right back to us. And thank you for that. And thank you for your book. And we'll look forward to keeping in touch and coming down for another visit soon. That sounds great. I, I've enjoyed, uh, you know, working with you. And uh, as you can tell, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. And I do think that it is a good story. And, uh, and people need to hear some good stories and uh, caring stories and with everything else that's going on in the world now. Yes, thank you. And you do have another book that you're working on. Could you just quickly tell us about that? I'm actually working on two books right now. Oh, uh, One book is uh, about Rose Hill Cemetery, and I'm talking about some of the stories that, uh, in addition to Stanley Fisher and Lester, about this small town about, and all, all the, the things that went on. And it's really unique things for a small town that are in Rose Hill Cemetery. And I'm also writing a book, you know, with a, a, another author on uh, the Raritan Bayshore and different unique elements and different sites on the Bay, Bayshore and, and uh, historical content and things like that. It, it's excited, too. Kind of keeps me busy. Terrific. Thanks. Well, we'll be all standing by to find out about those books, and maybe we'll have you back on for another podcast interview. <laughs> Sounds great. All right. Thanks again, Al. Take care. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. You can connect with us on Facebook and YouTube at Your History, Your Story, or on Instagram and Twitter at YHYS Podcast. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.